I'm going to present today a new zero knowledge proof system, line point zero knowledge, or LPZK. Dr. Ian Malcolm in the movie Jurassic Park said, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. At the risk of dramatically misinterpreting the meaning of the film Jurassic Park, I want to suggest today some reasons why you should check out our full paper on ePrint. Specifically, I want to describe both how LPZK fits within the broader universe of zero knowledge work, uh, what its contributions are, and uh, areas where it has uh, applications. And additionally, I want to describe some of the cryptographic technology that makes LPZK possible and some of the technical details of the LPZK construction that are designed to optimally exploit that cryptographic technology. I'm Sam Dittmer from Stealth, and this is joint work with Yuvali Shai at Technion and Rafi Ostrovsky at UCLA. To begin, LPZK is an information theoretic proof system, and it is designed for the designated verifier NISIC, or non-interactive zero knowledge setting. And specifically, LPZK in its simplest form is designed for the pre-processing designated verifier NISIC setting, where after an initial offline stage where both parties create correlated randomness, the prover needs only to send an encryption of their input to the verifier to who can then check that the witness does indeed satisfy the desired relation. It is possible to make this protocol fully non-interactive, but we will open the details. Now, this zero knowledge proof system has application especially to two areas. First, it is designed to minimize the prover complexity. A number of works, especially ZK SNARKs, have succeeded at dramatically minimizing computational or communication complexity, rather, which is generally the broad bottleneck. However, minimizing prover complexity is also valuable in some settings. For example, there are instances in cloud computing where you pay by the amount of computational power expended, but not based on uh, server to server communication. And there are physical situations where direct physical links between two parties exist and therefore the communication becomes a much smaller cost. Secondly, LPZK can be used as the building block for an improved functionality for reusable non-interactive secure computation, computation that is reusable NISC. In the same spirit as designated bear and NISC, reusable NISC allows a receiver to post an encryption of their input so that any sender can send a message to that prover or to that receiver who then is able to, without any further interaction, to compute the joint function of both parties' inputs. This is a actually very desirable uh, application that is still uh, not, not widely applicable to any known setting because of difficulties in optimizing this sort of procedure. Now, the geometric intuition behind line point zero knowledge can be encoded into the following diagram. Uh, here we represent line point zero knowledge in two dimensional space, but this is in general used for much higher dimensional spaces. But the core idea here is that you have a line directed by the prover that encodes the prover's witness. And the verifier is allowed to learn a single point on that line. Based on that single point, the verifier then determines whether to accept or, re or reject the proof. The cool tool in building this line point construction is something called uh, Vector Oblivious Linear Evaluation, or VOL. That's the picture. Uh, the functionality involves a sender and a receiver where the sender chooses two vectors, the receiver has a random field element and the receiver learns the, ve the vector v, a alpha plus b, which is equivalently simply the evaluation of 
the line AT plus B at the point alpha. This vol functionality is desirable for a few reasons. First, given an instance of a random vol, it is very simple for the sender to encode a fixed vol where the vectors A and B are fixed rather than being distributed randomly simply by sending a mass to the receiver. Second, there are very efficient recent protocols for generating random vol with sublinear communication where you uh, jointly construct short seeds for each party who can then run a local algorithm to expand to much, much longer random vol instances. And finally, the random vol construction allows a direct compiler from LPZK to arbitrary NISIC. The intuition here is coded in the picture on the previous page, but in order to give more concrete me metrics and to go over the construction more explicitly, we will define n, n prime, n double prime LPZK. For the full definition, we refer you to our paper, but at a high level, we will just give a description based on the following example. 762 LPZK begins with vectors AR, BR of length 5 that are generated by a random bowl procedure. Then A is extended by two elements of length of 0, and B is extended by two elements that are determined by Prover's witness. Additionally, there are six elements, A1, A4, A5, B2, B3, B4, that are altered from the original random vol instance and depend both on the random elements and on the Prover's witness. So formally, we could state that uh, there's a compiler from NN prime and double prime LBDK to a NISIC protocol in the ARVOL or random oracle ARVOL hybrid model requiring a single instance of random vol length n minus n double prime. This is because you can add the elements b6, b7 to b without an additional random vol because 0 alpha plus b6 is simply equal to b6, 0 alpha plus b7 is simply equal to b7, so constructing those elements of the vector OLE as equivalent to sending them in the clear. And then n prime plus n double prime communication because you need to communicate the n double prime above two red elements and the offsets for the n prime above six purple elements. And then by definition, this gives you, from the definition of LPZK, this gives you the verification for an arbitrary NP relation which in turn gives you NISIC. We now give a semi-formal statement of our main theorem. For any MP relation, we have LPZK. Sound of error is approximately 1 over field size, and the prover and verifier work is proportional to the circuit size. This can be implemented with a single instance of random vol. The pre-processing step I mentioned towards the beginning is simply the setup required for this instance of random vol. Now, the more precise metrics depend on the setting in our information theoretic construction. We have a family of protocols based on a uh, parameter t. For any t, we get 2 plus 1 over t communication in exchange for soundness error of t over field size. So, for example, for a field of 128 bits, taking t equal to log field size, we get 2.01 field elements of communication per multiplication gate in exchange for uh, seven fewer bits of soundness error. 121 instead of 128 bits of security. Now this gives us two to five times computation for the LPCK for prover work of computation in the clear. Now in the random oracle setting, we reduce communication to one field element per multiplication gate. The additional parameters R and Q deal with the security requirements in the random oracle setting where an adversary can make repeated queries to the random oracle. And 
by allowing the hash function to map to a field extension, we can increase the size of the base field from f to f to the r in order to allow q to be large without uh, dramatically reducing sound to Now I want to interrupt here briefly to describe what I call the constellation of concurrent works. So as we were publishing our paper on ePrint, two other groups of authors were working on the related ideas with the vol-based zero knowledge. Now, normally three points do not make much of a constellation, but I use the word to emphasize that each of these papers provide different contributions in a multi-dimensional multi space of possible, possible optimizations. Um, there's our work, which stands out as the only construction that is in securing the information theoretic model. The other constructions are exclusively limited to the random oracle domain. Wolverine by uh, Wang Yang, Katz, and Wang stands out for its optimizations for the case of Boolean circuits, whereas the other protocols are designed for the large field setting. And Mac and Cheese by Baum, Malazemov, Rosen, and Scholl uses a technique similar to that of stacked garbling and spirit for nesting disjunctions so that if your circuit consists of a disjunction of many smaller circuits, then you can save all the work and just do the cost of the long longest small circuit. Now, there is one setting where we can compare all three works directly, which is where none of the circuit-specific optimizations apply. We're in the large field setting in the random oracle model, and in that setting, LPZK requires the least communication per gate of one uh, field element per multiplication gate. I will mention here that uh, the authors of Wolverine released a subsequent work called Quicksilver, where they applied several of the optimizations from LPZK to the small field setting. Now, I will turn from giving the broad overview to giving some of the low-level details for understanding how vector OLE can be used to reduce zero knowledge. First, um, a vol is a natural choice for a MAC, a message authentication code. If your circuit contains several wire values AI, each one can be encoded in a MAC as follows uh, by the vol, VI equals AI alpha plus BI. Here, the prover sending BI to the verifier allows the verifier to compute VI minus BI divided by alpha, and the verifier is convinced that the prover holds the same value of AI that the verifier just computed. In addition to the authentication property, this setup also gives a masking. The, the value of VI is uniformly random if VI is just uniformly random. Once you have this setup, you can authenticate every wire value. You then nearly merely need to prove that the wire values satisfy the appropriate addition multiplication relations. This can be done using generic MPC tools. However, by exploiting the algebraic structure of the vol, we can obtain better optimizations. To state the previous slide again, we use the following picture. Here, the AIs again represent wire labels. There we have addition and multiplication gates represented. And the vector A is one of the entries to the vol from the prover, and the vector B is chosen uniformly at random. Again, for the addition gate, A9 plus A10 equals A13, it is possible to do the addition without any communication between prover and verifier. The prover can add A9 plus A10 equals A13, B9 plus B10 equals B13, and the verifier can add the corresponding values B9 and B, or V9 and V10 to obtain V13, so that V13 doesn't even need to be an entry in the corresponding vol. It can be computed locally by the verifier. For a multiplication gate, such as a1, A2, A9, the verifier needs to be convinced that for the values they hold, V1, V2, and V9, the coefficient of alpha there satisfies the multiplication relation. 
we perform this verification as follows. For every multiplication gate i, j, k, so for example, 1, 2, 9, p computes the following expression. Here, use an indeterminate, and the way this should be understood is that this represents p's view of what v is seeing with alpha. So when v here computes v i, v j minus alpha v k, p and u hold identical expressions with p being over the indeterminate u and v being a linear function alpha. Now if p cheats here, then the term a i, a j minus a k is non-zero, and so what v actually holds is a quadratic in alpha squared with a non-zero leading coefficient. p likewise holds a quadratic with non-leading with non-zero leading coefficient in u. Of course, because p is cheating, p can hold whatever they want, but the point is that what p really needs to do here is convince the verifier that they hold values x, y here, where x alpha plus y equals the expression the verifier has just computed. The way that the, the prover goes about convincing the verifier of this depends on whether we are in the information theoretic or the random oracle setting. The simplest way to do this would just be to extend the rule with the values x alpha plus y, and the verifier can check that this indeed match, matches what they expect should be of the form x alpha plus y. A more complicated way of writing what I just said is to extend the rule with x alpha plus y prime, where y prime is random, and then send y minus y prime. That's literally how the compiler from random vol to fixed vol works. However, we present it in this form to emphasize that uh, when we want to use for general t, we again extend the vol with x alpha plus y prime for every gate, but instead of sending the y minus y prime term each time, we wait for the first two multiplication gates and then send the product of all those terms the next two multiplication gates, and so on. Now, in the random oracle setting, we get a more complicated expression that is conceptually simpler. You take the values x and y. For each term, you multiply by the uh, random hash function h, and then you take the sum. The verifier then checks xh alpha plus yh against their value vh. Here, as is written, the terms mi correspond to the messages sent in the uh, compiler from random vol to vol. So at each point, when you complete a multiplication gate, you take the current message transcript and evaluate the hash function there to get the current weight you apply. This guarantees that changing the value of mi at any given point will then change the hash function from that point and all future points. Now I want to pause to just mention communication costs. In all cases, you have one field element per gate because that's the cost of just computing the fixed volt that gives you the AI terms in the original circuit diagram. That is the only cost from the random oracle settings since the, fall, since the final verification step is little of one per gate. In the case t equals one, we have two more elements, the one for x and then the y minus y prime term. And then the t, the t case, you have one field element for the x alpha term and then an average of one over t elements for the product of the y minus y prime term. So that's where we get three, which is a special case of two plus one over t for the information theoretic setting and then one for the random oracle set. We now give a very high level overview of the proof that LPZK has the desired zero knowledge and soundness properties. For zero knowledge, the verifier needs to be able to simulate the prover's inputs. More equivalently, they need to be able to simulate uh, the values that they see in their vault. For all the values a alpha plus bi, the randomness of bi means the values a alpha plus bi will likewise be random, so these are generated randomly. Similarly, any value x alpha plus y prime in the information theoretic, proofs can be generated randomly. The remaining values need to satisfy some relation that is used to check correctness in the honest run of the protocol. The simulator merely generates the values that is needed for the check to pass. For soundness, the cheating prover is either passing up a high degree polynomial as a lower degree polynomial. So in the case where AI, AJ minus AK is non-zero, 
they are getting a quadratic that the pretend is linear. Similarly, if any of the terms x alpha plus y and x alpha plus y prime actually have distinct values of x, you get a linear term instead of a constant term. The product of these terms is a degree at most t polynomial instead of constant. In either case, you subtract the lower degree polynomial from the higher degree polynomial and you still have a higher degree polynomial. And for the prover to construct a polynomial of degree at most t that happens to have alpha as one of its roots occurs with the most probability t over field size. The other way they cheat is that in the expression uh, sum of x times h of mi alpha plus sum of y h of mi, there are additionally uh, a term sum of a i a j minus a k h of m k times alpha squared, but the entire coefficient of alpha squared is zero because the random oracle happens to give that output. So the prover claims that all of the terms a i a j minus a k are zero, but some of them are non-zero, but that sum still is zero. However, changing m k also changes the value of a i a j minus a k, so forcing the, that entire expression to be zero depends on um, simply guessing values of m k until you get a zero, so that gives you that sound of zero that q, where q is the number of guesses, divided by field size. And that's the proof. We now give a very quick overview as well of the reusable NIST construction, um, which we have for general branching programs with those efficiency features. We need multiple parallel instances of vol. Uh, basically, for information theoretic reasons, we have to have a separate instance of vol for every receiver input. And so we need a certified vol functionality that can impose conditions on the coefficients of the several vol instances. This in turn relies on a vol with equality constraints that merely forces certain coefficients to match. So here we force the a in v1 and the a in w1 to match. Note additionally that some of the b coefficients match. Um, like the b1 and w2 and the b1 and v1, the b2 and v2 and the b2 and w1. So that guarantees that the following expression, all beta and alpha terms cancel and you get b3 minus b4. And so the sender can simply send b3 minus b4 to r who then checks that against the value they've computed. So from forcing uh, the a's to match there, you get equality constraints, you can transfer all coefficients to a single instance of vol and run LPZK to get general certified vol, and from there you get arithmetic branching programs. Now, to emphasize that this is a concretely effective protocol in many settings, we will give an example of bounded inner product. So here we have a sender S and receiver R with vectors XS and XR, and it is desired to compute the dot product of XS and XR. Now, suppose, for example, that uh, the receiver R is looking for a friend to play board games with, but really wants a friend who shares the same favorite board games. So imagine that XS and XR represent uh, answers to a survey about board games. The simplest way for S to make a friend out of R is to say that they love every single board game. And so S would choose the maximum possible value for each of the entries of XS, which is why we need this bound here on the L2 norm. Now for the following concrete set of parameters for vectors of a length of 1,000, we get the following costs. In particular, a total method size of 282 kilobytes, which for my concrete contrived example of board games and for other real applications seems promising. Additional details can be found in our full paper on ePrint. Thank you for your attention.